Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I am doing great, Tim. Fantastic, really. I hope everyone out there is doing very well. I hope you're doing very well. I am doing great. Thanks a lot for asking, Lance. We have a real interesting episode, but before we discuss that, I want to mention the end of April. What are we doing at the end of April? End of April. God, I feel like we have something on the calendar around April 29th, 30th, and May 1st. We're hitting Vegas, everybody. Crime Con. Yes, if you are thinking about going, let this 10% discount push you right over that edge. And you can use code CRAWLSPACE at CrimeCon.com when you check out, when you order your standard badge. Who doesn't want to be in Vegas at the beginning of the spring to hang out with your favorite true crime presenters, creators, podcasters? Honestly, it's so overdue. I mean, I, I don't even know what people look like anymore. I don't know what it's like. <laughs> I, I can't wait to get... I'm just going to go and I'm going to Zoom with everybody because I'm just so... That's what I'm used to now. I'm just going <laughs> to... If anyone wants a conversation, even if we're sitting together in, a, in you know, a Starbucks, we're going to have to Zoom because I don't know how to talk to people now. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to this as well, Lance. And I'm looking forward to doing live shows. We're going to try to do one missing live show and one crawl space live show, either at the podcast studio or maybe just on Podcast Row. We'll see what happens. Yes, we are so excited to be there on Podcast Row. And we are excited to be there with our new network partners, a company called Glassbox Media, we joined up with them over the summer of last year, and we couldn't be happier with their brand management, their ad sales management, and just their overall great attitude. Uh, they are the new kids on the block in the podcast business, but they are making quite an impression, and we can't wait to introduce you folks to them and maybe some other podcasters that we can start networking with. I think just making all these introductions and getting to know one another is going to be the highlight, personally for me, while we're there for those three days. Now, Tim, who do we have on the show? So, Lance, in this episode, we are speaking with a husband and wife team. They co-founded something called the Cold Case Consultants of America, and it's Jay Lynn and Alex Baber. Yes, you can see what they provide if you go to cccoa.us, Cold Case Consultants of America. And the reason why we're speaking to them is because they were in the news a few weeks ago regarding their involvement in Maura Murray's disappearance and how they are working on this now, bringing everything to the table, according to them, in their attempts to bring answers to the mystery of Maura's whereabouts. Yeah, we speak about Maura's case a bit. A lot of the conversations about them and their process and who they're working with, um, but we do get into Maura's case a little bit. And as always on this show, the opinions of our guests do not reflect our personal opinions, and uh, there are some facts that are kind of debated in this episode, so, you know, it's a little bit uh, unclear w what is the facts, I guess, on a couple of details in this interview. So I don't want to completely say this, this conversation is completely about Maura Murray, about the, probably the second half of it is. Um, we do speak about another, another person, uh, this, this fellow named Dr. Arpad Voss, and a device that he has apparently um, created. Yes, Dr. Arpad Voss is somebody who has invented this device that uses the DNA of an individual who is looking for a family member. So if your family member is lost or missing, this device can allegedly locate the remains of the person through the decomposition uh, using DNA. And from what we've read and what we're told, it's done with fingernail clipping. So, for example, Tim, if your loved one was missing and you knew a general area where they were, you would give your fingernail clippings uh, to this individual who would put it in this device, and that would lead them and indicate where that person uh, is buried or re where the remains are, where the decomposing remains are. And it, and it sounds great. I mean, if it, if it works, uh, then that would be incredible. I obviously don't know if it's if it works. Our Pad Voss claims it does. Um, our guests today say that they have some research that showed them that it did work. As you'll hear in the interview, we speak about uh, getting that information and we, and we haven't gotten it. And we recorded this episode way back in mid-December, so we did wait a while for a reply. 
That's correct. I know, like, bear with us, folks, on this long intro. Uh, I know that we sometimes come across as a little bit goofy, but we are professional as much as we can be uh, behind the scenes. And we did request information on our pad boss. We were told during this interview that they'll give us the background information on our pad boss. We've reached out to him for an interview to speak with him at least and have not received a reply. And we've asked for the background info on our pad boss, which was volunteered to us by the Babers. Uh, we've asked for that three times, including one the morning of this intro that you're that you're hearing right now and have not heard back. So we tried to do our due diligence and get this information and feel confident about putting out uh, this material. Uh, personally, I don't feel confident putting out this material. I want to go on record to say that it's my belief that our pad boss may use his position as a doctor to take advantage of families who are in desperate need of help. Well, you're right that um, that this grave detecting device, um, the Inquisitor, I believe it is called, um, is hotly debated, you know, and rightly so, right? If it works, then they, we're talking about uh, some incredible invention. And, uh, and if it doesn't... Um, you know, I I don't even know what to say. That's right. I, I personally don't know what to say. That's a good way to put it. It's, it really leaves me speechless. While we've asked for information on our pad boss, we have also asked for information from scientists, from biologists, from people who work in this industry, if this is even possible. And they've all said this isn't how DNA works. And throughout history, we've seen charlatans and frauds con families to take advantage of their situation. And in this particular circumstance, I personally can't see the alternative. So that being said, you might be asking the question, if we think that this person that they're speaking about, this Arpad Voss, is a fraud and his device is not legit, then why are we having the Babers on? And I think having the Babers on speaks to what is really great about the community who's looking into Maura Murray. I think that people will hear this episode and realize that there's still an element out there that wants to take advantage of families that are in desperate situations. I think it's almost like a red flag and a public service announcement to make people aware that this factor exists, not only in Moore Murray's disappearance, but in cold cases throughout the country. And I do believe that the Babers have their heart in the right place, that they want to help. But as you'll hear in the interview, a lot of liberties are taken with the details, and we do get into some debates about it. It's always healthy to debate, and I'm very, very curious to hear what the feedback is going to be from that community that we mentioned before that is very responsible and cares deeply about Morris' disappearance. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot for listening. We really appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Um, and again, really only the second half is when we talk about Maura Murray's case. A lot of it is about um, this organization, the Cold Case Consultants of America. Check out their site. And uh, thanks a lot for listening. We will see you at CrimeCon. Follow us at Missing CSM. And we are being joined now by Jay Lynn Baber and Alex Baber. How are you today? We're good. Thank you. We're great. Good, good. And well, you're busy. You you are popping up everywhere. Your organization, the Cold Case Consultants of America, seems to be in my inbox, in, in our, you know, like Google alerts, because you're covering certain missing person cases and cold cases that that we like to put you know alerts on so in case anything happens we we know like there's some developments and then uh just checking out your website you're getting a lot of press lately um so thank you again for coming on taking the time out of your day to do this with us uh and before we get into talking about specific uh cold cases can you um tell us what the cold case consultants of america who are you and when you start what do you do um, we're a small agency of select individuals with expertise in uh, individual fields that we've assembled to kind of uh, mitigate the issue with the overwhelming cold cases uh, that are out there. Since 1980 alone, there's over 200, I think it's 268,000 cases involving homicides um, that, that are unsolved and they're filed away as cold cases currently. And as you know, uh, the closing percentage on those cases, once they reach that 
uh, this label is around 1% result in a conviction. So it's, stag it's staggering numbers. And uh, my wife and I having a background, um, mine being in uh, protective services as a, as a PSO, and also having you know, worked cases since 2007 behind the scenes before going public in the last five, almost six months. Um, you know, we just, we have a knack for this. And then my wife, of course, she can give you her background and some of her information. Um, I'm actually um, an army veteran as well as Air Force. I did a presidential and diplomatic security and then was attached to um, psychological operations. Currently, I'm trying to obtain my um, forensics psychi psychiatry degree. And we just are trying to find answers and, you know, we don't want anything left unknown. Well, let me thank you for your service, first of all. That's uh, that's excellent. And also, what was the psych... The, I'm, you did something? Uh, the psych... Please un unwrap that for us. Um, doctorate. Um, I'm going for my PhD, also known as PSYD. It's on the lines of what people see like on Mindhunter. It's your psychiatrist that go and, you know, do profiling on your serial killers, your rapists, and see kind of how their mind ticks. And this is something that you became interested in while you were in the military? I've always been interested in the psychology part of it. I'm more or less been wanting to aim towards law enforcement in the past, but then I just realized that I'd rather just learn about the criminal in order to prevent. And uh, so that's what you do for uh, the Cold Case uh, Consultants of America? Not only do I do that, I also have um, a background in cyber technology, um, as well as um, collaborating with others to build um, databases, cybersecurity, um, as well as um, just still doing the profiling portion on it. My goodness. So uh, between the two of you, you you seem to have covered like ninety percent or more of what's needed to uh, not only prevent these crimes from happening, but to look into crimes from the past and and maybe get some uh, some new details, some some new evidence, some new uh, breakdown of the crime scene in order to uh, bring some answers to the table. It's it's really amazing. Do you have like a crew? How many people are part of your team? Well, we have a uh, an IT uh, membership, which is investigative team, which we have uh, the number one forensic document examiner in the world, Kurt Baggett. We have the leading anthropologist and Dr. Arpad Voss. We have a highly decorated uh, retired detective, Patrick Napoleon from Atlanta. Uh, we have Joe Cochran, so Hall of Fame inductee uh, from Michigan with uh, reporting, broadcasting, and he's a true crime uh, investigator uh, on his end, on his aspect. Um, so we've got kind of assembled this, this uh, a select team of individuals that have an expertise in a certain field, uh, including myself and my, and my wife, to where we're able to take these cases, as, as you just discussed. Some of these are going back. We're looking at cases in the mid-1940s, and we've uncovered forensic evidence using modern technology that's able to identify the perpetrators from over 70 years ago. And we're able to also uh, exonerate uh, a couple individuals that were incarcerated for crimes they did not commit, uh, one being William Hirons. That's the case we're working on currently. We discovered a fingerprint that was in the file from uh, Francis Brown's door jam, a uh, bloody fingerprint. And back then, when they took uh, William Hirons' fingerprint, they, they only had like seven points of identification. And, you know, FBI at that point, their standard was 13 minimum. Today, it goes up to around 18. And we, were, we have 19 points of identification on the fingerprint matching the individual. So we surpassed um, what is needed here to move forward with the judicial system and submit our new evidence and exonerate this man's name after 65 years of being incarcerated as an innocent man and dying in prison. So that's another thing we're focusing on. These, these really older cases, some of the new ones we've taken on also, um, Mara Murray, her family contacted us early this week and uh, our team are gonna be going up to um, New Hampshire in around May. Uh, we have a few new ideas. Um, I think we, we should be able to at least uh, identify where she was at, at the last point of contact beyond the crash site, and we may even be able to locate her. Well, that would be an incredible um, achievement 
uh, and you know, obviously keep us informed because we started our show, Missing More Murray, and it was you know over a hundred episodes dedicated to to her disappearance. And um, it's always good to have fresh faces and fresh eyes and fresh minds uh, a- a- approach the case and 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 bring a-, a level of expertise with them. Because even even not being a family member, like Tim and I are not related to the Murrays, we we started doing this because of the. Um, amazing community that was supporting the the search for Mora and just the passion that came with that so we were riding that wave and we still are but you know you start to not see things because you 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 get too close and you start to not see something that could be totally obvious and it happens once a week still to us like where we think like how did we not see that how did we not like how did we talk through all of that and not see what you know one detail so Welcome, welcome aboard is what I'm saying. Uh, we're glad to be here, guys. Um, you know, we've got some really strong leads um, that, that's directing us down a certain road here. And again, we feel extremely uh, uh, strong about possibly locating her finally. So we're going to see if this pans out the way we, we think it will. Well, that's amazing. Um, I cannot wait to hear more. Um, and uh, I just wanted to go back real quick. Um, Alex, you mentioned uh, talking about your your background. You said did you say you were a former PSO? I was just trying to figure out what. I'm a protective service officer. I did diplomatic security also. Um, there'd be personnel that would fly in, uh, political personnel, and I would be pretty much attached to them at the hip while they're here uh, stateside and then put them back on a plane and send them back overseas. Diplomats from like uh, Turkey, uh, UK, uh, they would come in for political for Obama at the time, Biden. Um, you know, I was at, the, at his residence on numerous occasions, um, working security, private security with the individual. So that's that's my background. And then again, as a child, I, I've been a, a autodidact and a polymath since I was you know old enough to put my pants on. And then uh, I was diagnosed with perceptionism at the age of 12, almost 13, uh, which is basically my brain's kind of wired a little bit different than the average individual. So when I look at a case file or I look, you know, even uh, the database we created of the serial killer letters and unapprehended uh, perpetrators, we, we have over, total we have over 2,000. I mean, but we only disclose we have 500. You know, we don't give everything away necessarily. But we run uh, cross-reference uh, for the context, the syntax, um, you know, anything that the uh, linguistics, and then we get this feedback. But that, I have the ability to kind of identify things the average individual doesn't. It's a blessing and a curse at the same time because it never goes away. My wife can, can validate that part. So, uh, but that's one of the, the benefits that we have. And, and that's one of the strong points that I bring to the table, you know, leading, leading the pack. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. What was that called again? Which one? Perceptionism? So yes, that's, perceptionism. That's an old medical term they no longer use. Now it's kind of aligned with, I guess it's called uh, neurodiversity. I think that was the new term they developed for a, a spectrum of, uh, you know, your... Uh, I guess I don't want to use the, the misterm here to insult anybody, but you know, someone has a, it's mentally altered or has it mentally challenged on a different level, the way their brain works, you know, that's, that's like Asperger's for example, something along that line. Yeah. Yeah. See, we, we learn something every single time we do these interviews. I've never, I mean, obviously heard, heard of, you know, being on the spectrum and Asperger's and, uh, but never neurodiversity. Oh, that's, this is uh this is fascinating to me right now. So, I mean, so, when I look at like, uh, you know, a, a cipher or a code or a letter, uh, the way our brain wires, there's other people out there like me. And I've actually uncovered some of these individuals being on the other side of the fence as, you know, serial killers that we've been able to identify. I identified one in 2007 um, publicly, and he actually ended up contacting me on my cell phone like 42 hours later. And he knew where I lived, he knew my name, knew, you know, my fiance's name. Uh, so we had to sell our house within two months and go off grid, literally, uh, for safety purposes at that time. Um, and after I got back into it again before we reopened the company, uh, like three three years ago, four, almost four years ago, uh, I found out that he, he passed on in 2010. So, but he was literally, he knew where I was and he asked me if I wanted to play a game. Uh, he, you know, he, he wanted to engage with me one-on-one. So it was, it was one of those, you know, moments where reality sets in, where you're not necessarily in a safe zone looking at these cases. You know, you kind of you step over that threshold to where you're physically involved at this point and having, you know, a family that you have to worry about, uh, you know, that brings a whole nother level of concern. 
And, you know, it was, a, it was a learning curve for me. And, you know, I, I chose at that time to disengage and go off grid. But now that we're back and, you know, uh, we're firing on all cylinders and ready to finish the job. Wow. Okay. So uh, let me, let's just unpack this a little bit. Um, so this, you, I know you've developed some new technology, and I think that's what you're, what you're referring to, that you were able to track this uh, person? That's correct. We tracked them over 54 years and 106 homicides uh, with an accomplice, which we're releasing the evidence here. Uh, we started releasing the evidence already on a lower level, but we're about to release the big picture here uh, within the next uh, month or two. So, and there's it's, this is going to literally put uh, the two of them as the as the number one uh, or pair of serial killers in American history. So it's been this has been really. Uh, eye-opening to us and this was just a, you gotta understand me and my wife were having a discussion one day and i said look we have all these letters right that we've accumulated over 14 years here and we have letters in the public's never seen i have letters in the Atkid cases uh the Atlanta child murder cases that was sent in by the ghost killer and the zodiac i have zodiac letters that public's never seen i have circle the letters that public's never seen um only uh eyes of, of law enforcement has ever been laid on these and I've been given access to them. So we put these into this database we created. And again, we cross-reference uh, the full spectrum here. We have what's called a register hit. So say there's a misspelling of a very odd word, like the Zodiac used truly, T-R-U-E-L-Y, in his 1979, uh, January 29th return letter after being on a hiatus for 34 months. Well, if you, if you research that, the spelling of that word is less than 1%. It's actually a 0%. It's 1880 as far as being in general context on any level any books, magazines, anywhere. Well, we found that same spelling in another letter with the same linguistics 20 years earlier in another murder. So we were able to connect these two based on linguistics in the database. So what it does, it kind of, it, it's almost like it sets up a red flag, basically. It says, look, look at these two cases closer because there may be a connection here. There's definitely similarities. And doing that, we've been able to uncover physical evidence or what they refer to as real evidence now to where we can run uh, modern day technology and forensics on it, uh, whether it be, you know, uh, latent print, audio analysis, spectrum analysis, um, you know, forensic document analysis by Kurt, all these other pieces, we kind of bring to the table with the team and we're able to identify the perpetrator. So it's it's kind of been a, a really um, enjoy, enjoyment for us to do this with the families because we actually interact with them almost on a daily or weekly basis with multiple families in multiple cases. And, you know, it feels good, man, to give these people answers. Like, you know, you've experienced it with the Mara Murray case, dealing with Fred and Julie and, and the rest of the family, I'm sure, uh, if you've had a chance to interact with them, you know, it feels good to give them answers, to provide them some factual evidence that they can actually say, okay, now I, now I understand or now I know uh, what happened. Okay, so where did the samples come from that you built this uh, database? came from the original family members that had copies from their their actual case files for say their daughter son father sister brother um some of them were foia requests on cases that have been closed to where the individual that was uh prosecuted or persecuted some of these cases the media persecuted the individual literally and uh were able to get those files because then the case is closed so you get access to, to public records some of the cases uh the det retired detectives have opened their personal files to us and give us access. Um, so we've had, we've kind of got a variety of assembling these letters here. We've been very, very lucky uh, in, in having this access and gaining these letters and having this ability to, uh, to correlate them. Wow, okay, so how many cases then are included in this um, linguistic database? I, in all honesty, um, if, when you talk about cases, you gotta understand some of these cases are, are multiple murders. Like say the DC Freeway Phantom, seventy-one, seventy-two. You had six victims, uh, young African American females. Um, you know the Atlanta, of course. You had what they have record is being twenty-nine children, all being male. Um, Zodiac, of course, his only accredited was five. Uh, Black Dahlia was one. You know the Texarkana Phantom was five. Um, the, the Lipstick Killer was three. OCCK. OCCK. We have four. I know we're connected with the families there also. So there's multiple uh, victims, but case-wise, safe number, I would say, uh, would probably be somewhere around 30, 35, because there are some individual cases uh, that are injected in there with letters. My goodness. Um, I got to go back a little bit and ask, how does one obtain uh, evidence from law enforcement on a case as high profile as a Zodiac? 
How do, how do you, because you can't, that's still open, right? You're not going to FOIA that. Well, you, you know, the, what happens is you you, uh, you build a relationship or a bond with, you know, one of the former detectives or one of the current detectives. And they understand that you're not here for fame or fortune. You're here to actually do some good. You know, we live in a very a cynical world these days, especially as compared to what these cases were. So what happens is with, with what we're trying to do, uh, you know, typically they would just say, no, we're not interested. We're not going to put our case files up. They're still, you know, currently uh, under the active tab here. But what good does that do? I mean, are we going to, in 100 years, are we still going to be asking the same questions? You know, look at the Jack the Ripper case. It's going on 130 years, guys. It's still unsolved and, and they won't release the files or records of people. What are we doing here? Are we trying to catch the bad guys or identify the bad guys after they're deceased? Or are we just going to keep going through the same motions? Because it's, it's repetitive now. So basically, if you go have a hard to heart with some of these people that really, truly care, that have had some interaction with the family members, they open their files to you. We've had numerous agencies open their files to us just in, in the past month. And are you focusing on cases in your geographic area? Mm, absolutely not. It's it's everywhere from California to Texas to Georgia to Massachusetts down to D.C., it's it's everywhere. I mean, we even have one that's not even what what do you say five seven miles from our house that happened. Yeah, Lindy Sue Belcher, 1975, December 5th. She was found in her apartment with a butcher knife through her throat, being stabbed uh, 13 times. And then on the one year anniversary, they mailed the letter, and uh, and they also took her tombstone and nicked it with the same amount of slashes and knife wounds that she had and then spray painted it red and we were able we've identified this individual so we're working with law enforcement on getting that out too okay uh what are you getting going in uh, massachusetts because that's uh our home state uh just curious what what cases you're working on here and also i'm very impressed that you're like an encyclopedia <laughs> and <laughs> there's no like oh what's that person's name again it's just like right there yeah that's again perceptionism that's my my connection i it's all about Numbers, um, you know, like dates, colors, names, locations. That's how my brain kind of files everything. So you can bring up a case. If I know it, I'll be able to tell you everything you need to know about it off the top of my head, which is kind of a blessing. But then again, it doesn't go away. So, but UMass, I mean, uh, Maura Murray, of course, leaving UMass, heading to New Hampshire was there. Um, you know, there's some other ones um, in, uh, well, the Connecticut uh, side of it, the New Canaan letters, um, the Joan Webster case, which is another big case. I don't know if you're familiar with that one where she left the airport, you know, and got in the back of this cab with this guy. And then, you know, they found her years later, her remains. Uh, and then we got the letters, the Zodiac letters connected to that, traced back to, you know, the New Cannon area. And then that being connected to Atkid, um through the uh, Danbury uh, card that was sent. So it's like a round robin here, guys. It's really crazy how all these things come together as one, because you really don't expect it. And, you know, I kind of see it, but then the, the uh, database kind of, you know, points it out to make sure that we, we kind of address it uh, on a singular level. So it's some kind of AI algorithm that you've uh, figured out? Actually, um, I use an OLD, which is an online linguistic database, as well as, I'm not sure Python. if you heard of Python. So I code and decode, and in order to write the database, it has its like own system in its inside of the system we've kind of modified it a little bit so when we digitize and enter the information dialogue uh, into the letter we what we do is wait this is my my uh, brainchild i said okay so let's say pick any random letter again let's go back to the zodiac you know january 29th return letter from 1974 right it mentions the movie zodiac or uh, exorcist in it he also quotes tit willow which is from the uh gilbert and sullivan mikado um, so what you do is you go in you, and I'll pick 10 things that stand out about those two things. So Exorcist was filmed in D.C. You know, you had the, um, the, the steps location. You had the Catholic Church involved. And if you put these things in there, when you hit the, the go button, such like Tit Willow, here's I'll give you one just for example. Um, the D.C. Phantom letter, the word insensitivity is misspelled. They always thought it had five eyes, right? But they were focused on the word tantamount because tantamount is a very unusual word used in, in our culture. Well, insensitivity was the word he wanted you to focus on. If you look at it closely, between the word TIT are two exclamation points. They're not eyes, if you want to bring that up. So the following letter in return for the zodiac, we got a registry hit on that because you used tit willow, but he separated the word tit from willow, which it's not supposed to be. 
and he left the W off. So he draws your attention to this phrase that he regurgitates three times. And of course, where was the exorcist film? DC, which is where the DC Phantom Note was, which has the same linguistics. So now we go back and you look at it closely. The Zodiac's last letter at that time was March 15th, right? When did the DC murder start? DC murder started April, the, the one month later, right? And then you have this thing that he wrote about he was going to kill children in the uh, October 13th, 1969 letter to Stein letter. The last column's about he's going to start attacking children, taking children out. OK, no one took him seriously. So you have the Fairfield letter, which is December 7th, December 15th, 1969, where he says, I'm going for the government life. Where's the government located? Washington, D.C. And he says right below it, do not forget me. You only tell people that phrase on two occasions. A, you're dying. B, you're relocating. You're moving away. You don't say, I wouldn't say to you guys, hey, guys, uh, I'll, I'll see you next week. Don't forget me. Or, you know, I'll see you two, three weeks a month. Don't forget me. Don't forget you means either you're, you're leaving where you're at or you're passing on. And once you get to, if you pull up the DC Phantom note, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's insensitivity. It actually has two exclamation points on each side of the word TIT, uh, T-I-T. And then you have, again, the tip below with the exorcist connection. That's incredible. Okay. Uh, but also, you just gave me my new sign-off. Whenever we end a show, I'll tell Tim that I'll, I'll tell him not to forget me at the end of each show. And then when you listen to the episode, you'll be like, oh, I gave them that idea. Yeah, right. Yeah, this is crazy, though. You know, this again, linguistics. This is something that uh, Fitzgerald used to track down uh, Ted Kaczynski, literally, was because of his manifest. And, you know, and he kind of pioneered this, right? And uh, he's friends with us both, you know, through Facebook and whatnot, him and John Douglas, of course. And, uh, you know, these people here that kind of pioneered these new uh, tech or not new techniques but were new techniques. A lot of them didn't get the respect out of the gate, you know, uh, but now that we've been able to take that and now we've evolutionized it with the uh, technology we have and digitizing it, it just makes it a whole lot easier. So we've kind of, you know, we've thought out of the box. We're kind of doing our own thing on a reservation here and it's working. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. Well, let's talk a little bit about Mora and what you can, um, what you're bringing to the table with that, uh, you know, her disappearance. This question is not meant to sound, I guess, patronizing. So I apologize if it comes off like that. But with all of the investigative agencies, both professional and and independent, um, what is it that that is going to be different about what the two of you and your organization are going to bring where you can confidently say, I think we can probably find her. Well, I mean, we have history there as it is. Uh, Dr. Arpod boss has already been with the family on a previous occasion and has been out there and he has patented machines that, that he uses to detect decomposition in the air. You know, you can detect decomposition up to 75 to hundred years. And this is patent machinery that he's actually developed. Um, another thing is you got to go back to square one, which my wife can cover some of that with her forensic background in psychology. Uh, Moore was disturbed. You know, she had to leave her life dream when she was um, at West Point, uh, had a mishap there. She comes to UMass. You have the situation with the pizza, you know, which is minor. It's a misdemeanor. But then again, she's pursuing pursuing her nursing background. And as you know, if you have a uh, it's a one two bang when you are ha- going for an RN, uh, it disqualifies you. And she had a DUI on that Friday, just three days prior to her disappearance. And then she had another DUI driving, uh, you know, she wrecks up in uh, Haverville with the Saturn. This guy pulls up, you know, he's trying to be help her. He realizes she's out of cell phone range, obviously. And, uh, and she realizes that, you know, she's kind of jammed here. Law enforcement's going to be on, on the scene in a matter of minutes. And she doesn't want another DUI within three days. First off, she let her father down, disappointed him. She's having issues with her sister and the situation is going on there. You know, and then you have uh, her returning the clothes to her friend at the university, which telling her she, she didn't have a plan on coming back anytime soon. Uh, she pulls her cash out of that account, $280. She goes and buys an excessive amount of alcohol. And she's been trying to locate a lodge up where she feels comfortable, where she has fond memories, where there's a connection with her that can bring her some peace of mind. She, she Her world was falling apart around her, guys, obviously. I'm sure you know this. You're familiar with the case. And, you know, she, that, I think the straw that broke the camel's back was, of course, the, the second accident, the, the DUI, the option of law enforcement appearing on the scene and her, again, not having any option for an RN license. She would have been disqualified, guys. Her, her, her life dream from West Point was taken. Now her RN would have been taken from her. And I think she fled uh, not thinking straight. You know, we have the open case. As you guys know, there's four packs of sleeping pills uh, to a single cylinder or six to a box. They found five boxes. One was missing. 
you know, you had spilled wine outside, it consumed the alcohol, the mix in the, uh, in the, uh, the Coke bottle uh, for the Baileys. You know, she'd been drinking heavy. Uh, she had the, the vodka uh, coolers that she was drinking. She had, when she left UMass, she was definitely drinking heavy. And I do believe that, you know, with the cell phone records we have, um, I believe that the reason there was an hour gap there, a 45 minute gap to an hour gap there is because I believe she met, missed her turn off. I believe she went north past the exit um, and turned around and came back. And I think that threw her off because she was under, she was intoxicated. Um, that's, that's my opinion. I do believe that she headed across, you know, there's no, they can see somebody light a cigarette, right? But they can't see brake lights stopping for a car. So I don't think she was abducted. I don't think she found foul play at the hands of somebody else. Um, I think that her state of mind was very off. I think she felt that she let everybody down, especially her father. And, you know, again, I think she wanted to cross. You have the, the, the small stream there, a river there that flows right in Haverville into the Connecticut River. And, you know, here's my thoughts. I think she may have been located, guys. I think she may have already be in the possession of law enforcement or her remains that's been overlooked as a Jane Doe or as possibly not ever being identified as being Maura Murray. That's my personal opinion. That's a that's a lot to uh, yeah that's a lot. Um, I just have a couple of uh, questions here. Is there something that we missed uh, with her being charged with DUI? Because as far as I know, she was never actually charged with any DUIs, and it was never actually proven that she was drunk during the uh, during the accident. Yeah, she was, she, she was drunk when she hit the the guardrail head on. I know that to be factual. The first accident, which was Friday after she went to the party, bought her father's vehicle and totaled it. She went and picked the accident report up before she left. Um, the Am- Amsys area, heading up to New Hampshire, of course. So that tells me there her state of mind isn't committed to doing something to herself. Because if so, why would you stop to pick the action report up? Doesn't make. Oh any yeah, sense. yeah. I, I just want to uh, be clear with anyone who's listening that there's no information out there that uh, there's, there's no charge if there's not a person to charge. She's missing. It happened on a Friday. Happened on a Monday, right? There's nobody to show up in court to be charged. Yeah, but there was an officer there at that first accident. I don't believe he charged you with a DUI and I think uh, when he responded to a reporter's question he said I would have charged you with a DUI had she been drunk I, I'm gonna have to look uh, I've heard differently I'll look into it a little bit closer to see yeah. whether he charged her or not I don't think she was ever charged what I'm saying is, is that had she not disappeared on Monday the 9th I believe she could have been charged if that that would have cost her her already and of course the Saturn she would definitely have been charged I mean, there would be no doubt about that. So she definitely would have lost her RN uh, license, guys. She would not qualify. And uh, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, I guess, what why you think um, she could have been uh, located uh, at this point? Well, I mean, there's a lot of things here. When you get when you look at the connection there between the smaller uh, waterway it flows right in through again Haverville into the Connecticut River, which is a much larger water source, and the flow there, I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. Of course, it's it's a rather strong current. So it doesn't take someone long within a matter of, say, 24 to 36 hours, they can be miles and miles away, literally. And in that case, she may end up further out of the jurisdiction, not found for two, three. I've, I've actually investigated cases um, with my wife and the team to where the remains were found outside the jurisdiction, of course, uh, in a waterway. And they had them in their possession literally for 12 years and never knew that it was the individual they were looking for. Literally. So this is, again, is another option that I believe that there, there may be something here. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me, guys, that, you know, how can you see somebody spark a cigarette, right? Through your window, but you but you didn't see any taillights. You didn't see any headlights. You didn't see a vehicle stop in between the trifecta of the houses, right? How is that unaccounted for? But, yeah, you can see someone light a, a tip of a cigarette from many, many yards away. So that doesn't make sense to me. That tells me I don't believe a car stopped and picked her up. I think she fled to the woods, um, you know, not thinking straight, obviously. Now, I, I spoke with Julie, of course, but there's other things I'm concerned about here. I can see that there is an impact to the windshield, uh, but the airbags were deployed. So that tells me her seatbelt was off, right? So was there, was the deployment of the airbags to the slight to where her head actually impacted the windshield above the steering wheel and then deployed? That, that split second when she makes the impact before the airbag actually deploys, it's an older vehicle. I used to own a Saturn III, just to let you know. They stay, they're awful cars. And, you know, the, and I had an ex- accident with mine, uh, very similar to hers, and it was in the snow, but I hit a telephone pole. And it, the airbags did not come out instantly, guys. I'm going to tell you that right now. That's a fact. Uh, and maybe because it was a 97, and, you know, this was 2008. Uh, maybe it was because, you know, the, uh, the gas for the cylinders release was maybe – 
I don't know, the compression had gone down over time, whatever the reasons, I'm not a mechanic. But I can tell you what, my face at the steering wheel for the bag hit me. Um, so I'm wondering if that crack over the driver's side is from her forehead, you know, and then what's that do to you? You've been drinking, obviously. You have this wine that's been spilled outside. There's Bailey's mixed in with the uh, uh, the Coke or whatever Pepsi it was. You have the, the uh, wine case, the box, it's half gone. Um, you know, that's a lot of alcohol for somebody. How much more away? What, a buck, a buck 10, a buck 20, a buck 15? She's a very small girl. You know what I mean? So the, imagine what her blood alcohol level was. And what happens when, and, and again, when you have an impact, especially the head, what does it do? It sobers you up. Your adrenaline level goes through the roof. I don't care how drunk you are. And I've seen this again firsthand uh, with my background. It wakes you up. You, you're like, holy crap, what's happened to me right now? That whole buzz and alcohol thing goes out the window um, from, the, from the adrenaline release. So I think she got out. She came to and said, holy crap. Guy pulls over the bus, you know, like he says, what's going on? Are you okay? She, she didn't seem like she was drunk because just, her adrenaline was pumping. Uh, and she was scared. She was absolutely scared. She didn't want to get arrested for a DUI. Okay. And um, so your theory is that she sort of wandered into the woods by the wild Amanusik and uh, fell in and I guess went unconscious and, and kept floating further? I think what happened, guys, you know, it's it's uh, it's midnight out there, man. You can't see your hand in front of your face, especially in the woods. Uh, I think she's fleeing. It's not very far off the roadway if you head down straight direct about 150 yards I think she was just trying to get away from the scene again, you know, just, it was too much for her. And she may have actually walked into the river uh, or again, at that point, the, we have to account for the missing sleeping pills. Uh, you know, that's gotta be a concern here, especially in her state of mind. Something that we've talked about a lot with, um, with this is, uh, and we've gone up there more times than I can count is the, the road that uh, she was on route 112 and how windy that road was. And, how it how difficult it would be because a lot of people have that theory that she was very drunk and drinking while driving um it's almost impossible to navigate that going more than 30 miles an hour sober without going off the road so for her to get to that point is always has always struck me as odd and i always question people when they assume that she's been drinking and and heavily drunk because i don't think that anyone who's um drinking as much as some people think she was drinking could have made it to that point. Looking at it on a on a map, it doesn't look so much like the windy road that it is. But if you're going over those hills and down and around and over the hills, and you can get into this road hypnosis, especially if there's snow, not snow falling on that night, but just like your headlights hitting the snow. I mean, I've been driving up there and just like zoned out, totally sober, and and thought I'm. If I if I like nodded off, I'd be I'd be into the woods right now. So that's just something I wanted to bring up. Like once you drive that road, you, you might you you might form another opinion. And say, well, if she was that drunk, I don't know if she would have made it here. I don't know if she she would have been able to get here. Well, think about it from this perspective. Then uh, I can understand that. But if she's if there's a forty five minute to an hour gap here between the drive point from university to where the accident was, right? Maybe she's doing thirty miles an hour when she leaves the highway. Maybe she slowed down and she just happened to a sleet of ice at that corner. Maybe she had a patch of uh, black ice or whatever. And, and of course, you can see um, from the damage to the vehicle, she impacted her front left, spun her rear around, was facing the direction she had come from. Um, and then again, you, I mean, obviously, she was drinking, guys. The wine's poured out. That's her way of trying to disperse what's left in the vehicle. They find the uh, the substance within the Bailey's within the uh, the bottle that's already in the vehicle, and then you have you have to count for the vodka uh, coolers too, guys. So, and she's only in a vehicle. So, who drank the, all the alcohol? Who drank it? She's not driving down the road throwing it out the window. And and then another point you have to look also is that from that perspective, uh, you know, again, her blood alcohol level. She she's a small girl. She's I'm you know I'm six foot three, two hundred and you know thirty pounds, guys. I could drink all that, and I'd still be still be bust. Where where I I know that there was uh, some alcohol that was found in the vehicle, and then there was the talk of uh, what was it like the Smirnoff, like a malt liquor that was found. I think it was an eight pack or ten pack. I don't remember off the top of my mind, but I do know that there was four that weren't accounted for. Um, that's that's what I have read. And then of course you had the box of wine, which some of it was dumped out, so that'll be accounted for. And then the mixture was the Bailey's. So she makes three different kind of alcohols here, guys. Three different substances, and again, in a small girl small body frame yeah I, this is the first i've heard about the baileys and diet coke being mixed together yes absolutely where did you get that information because we've always heard that she was drinking uh wine through a twizzler out of the diet coke that was the theory 
Well, the police officer said it was in there. The state trooper that was actually recorded, uh, I think he was even on disappeared, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, disappeared. He even said it on there that, that, that they had found that it was mixed in the bottle in her car. But obviously it was in that bottle and the bottle was, was consumed by somebody and she was the only one in the vehicle, guys. So, I mean, what we do is we get down to the facts. We, we, we eliminate opinions and assumptions. We try to form our own theory, getting down to the hard facts. What we can hold, feel, touch, smell. You know, we, we don't go off someone else, you know, well, it looked like this or she sounded like that. You know, we just want to get down to the, 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 the physical uh, hard evidence. Cool. No, that, that's awesome. Uh, to address the cigarette uh, smoking, hard evidence on that. Uh, we, we actually spoke to Tim Westman, who is the neighbor whose wife said that it looked like somebody, a man smoking a cigarette. And he said, no, that's not accurate. It, it was a red light. So that he, he, he said to us, no, she, it was a red light, could have been a reflection, could have been her cell phone. He said there wasn't a man smoking a cigarette. Well, what I can say is for anybody to assume that a tip of a cigarette from that distance resembles any kind of a light. I mean, would she have a pen light? I mean, if you, if you have a brake light or if you have a reflection or even a phone, the you guys know this, even the old phones from that time, the screen was still two by one, two, and a, two by one and a half. It's, it's nowhere near the size of a tip of a cigarette. No, I know. Uh, yeah, her phone was one of those flip phones and it might have had a little red light at the top, but but the 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 cigarette smoking i mean faith westman said specifically a man smoking a cigarette um so now you've introduced like an entirely new person to the equation so that's why that's why you know just speaking with people and investigators and and even tim westman you're looking across the street in the dark at somebody she's got her hair you know she's got her hair pulled back i mean and and i saw a smaller man across the way you know and when you're stressed you smoke you know what I'm saying? If you, what happens to you? It's people that do smoke or or have access to cigarettes. If they get an accident, they're stressed. They're gonna light one up. It's just it's- yeah. The, and and also, uh, I think something that we've lost uh, sight of from time to time is that uh, every you, the the human element to just make a mistake. The, the perhaps the dispatcher uh, was it Rhonda Marsh? The dispatcher, uh, perhaps hearing Faith Westman say. I think someone's smoking a cigarette and she transcribes it as man smoking a cigarette, you know, and that's where it starts to like snowball into another story. Uh, we, have, we have to look at the whole picture, but we need to only account for what is, which is hard evidence guys. That's the only thing we can really account for because there's so many injected opinions here. I mean, you have people like Renner, you have people that are there, the law enforcement was involved in itself. You know, there's, there's just the, the local on, and the state level. Then you have the family involvement of course, because they want answers. They deserve answers. You know, this is, this is, unacceptable here it is 18 years later almost 18 years later and this this woman's unaccounted for she needs to be brought home to her family at whatever cost and you know we uh, fund our own uh research all our connections for the, the labs that we use we have our own investors we have over a quarter million in investors uh that have put money in just the last six six months in our company and you know we have the backing we have the capabilities and we have the ability the ability as far as expertise here and I think, again, that we should be able to to uh, locate her. I feel very positive in saying that. And I look, one thing I don't do is bullshit, guys. You can ask anybody that knows me. So if I if I call it, I usually I'm, I'm dead on. So let, we'll see where, where this takes us. But I want to bring Mara home. She deserves to come home. And we're going to to do that. Well, I uh, I hope you're right um, about uh, this, because uh, that would be amazing to um, finally put an end to um to this case, maybe introduce some closure. Um, and tell us about, you mentioned a different machine um, that uh, measures decomp in the air. Is that what you said? That's correct. He has a patent, he has 16 patents. This machine he actually uses has been used uh, on location for George Hodel for the Black uh, Dahlia in the Hodel residence and actually picked up the decomposition that was at, at that residence if we research it. Um, and he was actually up uh, working with the Murrah family prior uh, just a few years ago, I was working with Fred and, uh, you know, the other family members that met him there. And apparently they got a registered hit up there too with his machine. Um, he was talking to me about, it. he flew in one last Friday, last Friday, spent the day with me going over evidence and everything. And, you know, he was filming me in on what had happened with his experience, uh, up there personally. And, uh, yeah, this machine, it's, uh, he, he nicknamed it was an inquisitor or, uh, I can't remember the exact name he gave it, but apparently uh, it's been tried and true, guys. So we're going to put it to the test again, uh, you know, under the new theory, see where we're at here. So how does that work in uh, regards to the theory of her going into the um, Amanusik River 
and perhaps being in uh, being, I guess, perhaps already being found. And that wouldn't pour into that. What I'm saying is she's oh. going to bring that. That is just another option. While we're up there, we might as well try to cover everything that we can um, make the trip, uh, of course, uh, valuable to not just us, but to the family. And if he's up there and we do pick something up, you know, he, he was he didn't have access to the areas that we're going to uh, that we're planning to, to to visit at that time. But again, I just want to take him up there with us uh, and the rest of the team under a new perspective. I want to start from square one again. So you plan on going up there around the time of the anniversary? Uh, negative. We're going to go up in May when the weather's a little bit better. Uh, I was going to say, <laughs> that, was, that was actually my point, was, like if you have an option. <laughs> I was thinking about going to the anniversary, you know, but then the team and I, we got together as a and was talking about this, you know, what if it's a snowstorm or what, you know, if it's covering the uh, the ground as it is, it's just going to make it uh, difficult for us to do what we need to do. So why not just wait until you know, the weather breaks and it's warm out and we can actually, you know, have everybody up there. And he, and he's, he has access to some of the best uh, cadaver dogs, uh, canine dogs in the United States, uh, Dr. Bostas, you know, he, he has action where we have access to this and he offered to bring them up there um even years later again they can smell decomposition much like his equipment it's his patent equipment here so we're gonna get a double whammy here we're, we're throwing everything at this guys we're gonna bring the kit and caboodle here to, to find more if we can we're we're gonna call out yeah i would say that the um the only benefit you would have by going up there in february is to see what the wild amanusic looks like at that time just to see what the, how that river flows at that time um I guess May might be a little late, but definitely check out because I, I could see this. I could see this being the scenario where if she went into the water, uh, it's 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 too frozen in places for a smooth like a smooth uh, trend, like a flow of a body to smoothly go. Like you'd get hung up on some of those rocks. You get hung up on some of those ice um, structures that have built up. But once the thaw happens around April, then it's like that's why it's the wild Amanusik. After that, we've actually made a joke that it's the mild Amanusik because it's like, where's the water? Like, oh, I heard that. Yeah, you're not the first one to tell me that. So let's, you know, if there, were, let's say for some reason she was actually in the river and lodged somewhere, waiting for the the water level to rise or for the break. You know, that's a lot of things we have to take into consideration too. We don't know. I mean, once you start assuming something and sticking to it without having an open mind, that's when you limit yourself. And then again. We're not bringing anything to the table to the people before us. We, and we, we don't want to do that. We want to start again with every option available and just start eliminating things. You know, once we're able to, to, to wipe it off the table, guys, and not focus on that, we can refocus on something else and, and see if, again, uh, it just takes one break. You know this. You guys, you know, this isn't your first rodeo. It just takes that one one small uh, piece or, or one break and we're good to go. I'm fascinated by the new technology that you've introduced, the this linguistics, um, but also this, um, I guess, decomp measure. Is, is it the grave detection machine? Is that what it's called? He has it. He actually has his own term for it, which I, we can forward to you. That'd be great. Inquisitor. The Inquisitor is one of them, but he has multiple multiple. Yeah. Like certain people call it one thing and it just, you know, everybody has nicknames for certain things. I, I will definitely forge you the uh, information and research on it, guys. So you guys are up to speed on exactly what it is. It's very interesting and, and quite impressive. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, so they, again, they use it for Elizabeth Shore. They found like decomposition in the hotel house uh, for uh, George Odell's residence like 70, 70 years later. It's, it's, it's It was very impressive. Very impressive. So, and then they had, oh, they, they back up with support, you know, with the cadaver dogs come in and they register the hit where he actually finds it. And then they found, I guess, um, you know, there's also DNA involved here for, for validation purposes. So I was, I was skeptical and be honest with you guys. I was at first, you know, I'm, I'm one of these realists, you know, these guys that, uh, you know, I got to touch and feel it, uh, you know, smell it for it to exist in my world. And yeah. Impressed. So you've seen it work. Yeah, well, I've seen I've seen the effects of what I've never personally seen it working in, but I've seen the research of what's what's come from the use of it, meaning that that it's legitimate. How did um how did uh Mr. Voss enter into your orbit in the first place? Well, it was a contact, uh, believe it or not, through Jay Lynn's ex husband, who's military, and he reached out to us and. Uh, he did an NDA, reviewed our evidence on these other cases that we have with the, the forensic evidence we've uncovered using the database, uh, looking at the cases, and 
he said that, you know, he's never seen anything like this. Same thing that uh, Kurt Baggis said, same thing that Detective Patrick Boyan said, same thing that Joe said, you know, uh, which sign NDA and he sat down with me for eight hours. You get the right of your life. And then uh, afterwards, they they requested to join the team and want to be part of this because we're, you know, we're being told by law enforcement, we're rewriting history. We are literally rewriting history. And uh, so I, I just... Um... I believe I found some uh, an article here. The Inquisitor is that the name of it? I believe, the Inquisitor. I it. It sounds like it. Inquisitor sounds like it. I think there was one woman who wrote up on her something like that was trying to debunk it right. without having any, any research or actually seeing the result. It's pretty easy to find that article when you uh, Google Arpad Voss. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's always going to be individuals that uh, do not research or have supportive data when they make claims. It's another. That's another thing in my uh, wheelhouse I do not uh, respect or enjoy. So when you come and you join, especially when you join CCOA and our team, you check your ego at the door. That's the first thing. Uh, second thing is you better bring something to the table and, and it needs to be legitimate. Uh, you said the law enforcement was telling you that you're rewriting history. And I think that's a pretty amazing thing to uh, to have in your corner when you're talking about law enforcement. I'm wondering if you have discussed any of this with um uh, the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit or uh, the Assistant Attorney General. Um, have you let them know that you are now uh, approaching Moore's disappearance? Negative. The only people I spoke to was, uh, was with Julie, the family, and also the reporters that are involved. Um, we have connections to them. Uh, they're doing the stories on us. Uh, multiple stories, as a matter of fact, that are in the works here. But no, see, here's how I operate, guys. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I do not go to law enforcement. They come to me. I, I open a uh, reinvestigation on my own. I announce it publicly. I get my team together. We go and we get we get what we need. If they don't want to work with me, they don't have to. Uh, there's always another way. But I get to the bottom of things, guys. You know, I, I, I do not mess around. And you'll find out really quickly once you get to know me. And if you research me, you'll see this. Uh, I, I do not play games, especially when it comes to victims and their families. Awesome. I can't uh, wait to see what uh, the result is of, of your your searches and your investigations. Um, truly hope that there is some answer. Some answer. Uh, there was the bones that were recently discovered on Loon Mountain, and we did a couple of ep- episodes on that. And we, you know, a lot of behind the scenes research on that. And it just seemed like through everything we'd heard, it all kind of came together and made sense that if there was a body there, it was hers. And it turned out that it was not. It was another unfortunate, um, (laughs) it was another unfortunate individual. So, you know, there's so many of those, so many of those uh, moments where the, the lead is there. It seems so tangible. Yeah, the the house that they searched a couple of years ago um, felt like that was going to be the case. And then they had the press conference where they came out only to say there was nothing found. I mean, just these gut punches. You know, especially with the family. I mean, imagine that. You get your hope up, right? You have these people that come in. And that's why I make clear when I talk to Julie, I said, look, I'm not trying to get your hope up. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, look, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. I'm always going to be honest with you. And if I think that we may be able to I look at your sister, I'm, I'm going to tell you that. Uh, am I, is there a possibility I could be wrong? Absolutely. Everybody before us has failed, but failure is not something I keep in my toolbox. You know, I'm very pr- proud of my background and what we do. Uh, and we're going to we're going to go at it. Uh, the team's are roaring to go 100 percent here. And again, we have a new perspective, a new uh, vision on what we're going to look at here. And we're going we're to see what works, guys. Yeah. And the, the one piece of advice, take it or take it or leave it when you when you do go up there in May. Uh, just be very sensitive to the people up there. If if they feel like they're being rubbed the wrong way, even if your intentions are good. I mean, they 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 want nothing to do with this anymore. They took the tree down. They rope off the parking lot from the old weathered barn. Um, and they didn't ask for this to happen. You know, in the beginning when we were doing our show, we we kept thinking like, that's so insensitive of them. But then we start hearing stories about people going up there, taking pictures, people who used to live at the A-frame home, like that, that place has gone through like three owners because they're just like, we live on a back road that you have to really try to find. And they have people going by dark tourists taking pictures and stuff. So that's what that community is, is used to. Um, and if you're going up there to get answers, I was just, you know, say tread lightly with them and they've already told everything they know, you know? Yeah. We're not, no, we're not going to, you know, waterboard anybody here guys. We, we, we're all about, you know, we're, we're good people. We have a good heart. We have a good reputation. Um, my company's respected uh, highly and we plan on keeping it that way. 
We just we just don't like taking no for an answer, meaning we're not going to give up. You know, we're not going to force anybody or make anybody uncomfortable when it comes to interviewing them or trying to get information ever. That won't be tolerated. But uh, we're just not going to throw our hands up in the air after the first day and say, oh, you know, let's just go back home. That's that's not that's not going to happen. Well, you guys are very valuable to this. I, I'll let you know, um, you know, in all the press that we're getting lately in these other cases, it's people like you bringing this to light because these older cases, especially, they they fade into the past, guys. They're they're literally forgotten. Either they're filed away in an old cardboard box on a, on a shelf somewhere or they're put in a hard drive and stored. And as you know, out of sight, out of mind, I mean, especially when the family members are getting older and eventually they're going to pass on too. So you go to the second generation that really aren't going to be that involved. So like Elizabeth Short's case, you know, like these other cases, Texarkana, they become just, if they're not infamous, then they just, they're forgotten. And it's individuals like you, and I want to thank you for doing what you do, because one day it's going to pay off. I, I promise you one day, it may not be, you know, May, may not be next year, but eventually more is going to be found, if not by us, by somebody, I promise you, because you and I both know you just don't disappear.